trying to make it as simple as possible by putting myself on the bedding one. It should be any more complicated than just an on off button for the cameras. But um, then it turned out the casing they got for the camera, they didn't have a window to show the, the light that was either red or off. So that was just a little design thing that we missed. So we had to spend a lot of time on the phone with them trying to get them to listen to the contract so they can move along. Like the little details too, they always get you. I'm sure you realize that too. Question? So I have a question. It has, you mentioned sensors, mm -hmm. right, to read the environment. Mm -hmm. um, does it move? What, what does it move? Or is it, it doesn't move. It doesn't have a propulsion system. Okay. Um, it just, Noah pays fishermen to have this on their boat, and then they drop it in the water with a rope connected to the boat. Leave it there for about 15, 20 minutes while it collects data, and they haul it back up. Okay, and so what type of intelligence is it? With, or why do you call it a rope? Because nowadays we use the word robot to read. Compass everything. Why do you consider it a robot? I call this one uh, because it's a machine that acts on its own. You know, the cameras, they're collecting data, they're measuring the blender, the size of the fish, they're storing the data onto the hard drive, it's the machine that's on its own. That's why I'm calling it a robot. Okay. Using the term that we use. But it doesn't, like, it doesn't read the environment and act a face upon the ground. It just, it's no. just collecting data. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. okay. It's just that sometimes we have that discussion at class and we really need to try to figure out because it's a very, you know, the word is very easy to find. You could also call it just a uh, fish monitoring system. Mm -hmm. so no, it's a robot. It's sounds <laughs> better at home, but that's okay. <laughs> Thanks. Can you talk a little bit about um, how did the team came together and experiences? Like, it's a tool that you have a very good synergy uh, with, uh, with the guys. So how how's that interaction? Because you probably, until you started working on this, you met them, right? So. Yeah, I think so. Fabian and Christo really brought the team together. Uh, I met Fabian a little over a year ago, and not, not all six of the Aquanauts, we had never been in the same room until I think we were all a little bit nervous that we wouldn't get along, but it turned out we all got along pretty well. I don't know if that was lucky or if it's just because like if people sign up to live underwater for up to 31 days, then we have something in common. Can you tell me a little bit about the process so they can understand how you got there? Because it's not because you just raised the hand, right? No, no, I think Fabian, um, you know, I work in robotics at MIT and I was just about to graduate and I was working with the his grandfather had a strong connection with Doc. Had a strong connection with Doc Richardson at MIT, a professor who did American Legion. And so we wanted to sort of rekindle that relationship and we reached out to MIT. Do you know the story of the other guys? Or? The other guys? So um, FIU is one of the, it owned Aquarius and it's one of the sponsors for the project. So they were going to send two researchers. And I, Andy and Adam were. 
are chosen based on the research projects, I think. Both of them are doing research that pretty much has to be conducted while saturation is. And then Liz McGee, she's from Northeastern. Northeastern is another one of the science partners, and they were going to send one off and on. And she's the one with the most data.